to apartment complex when the rent's $434 a month, all seven units are occupied. When the rent is increased to $476 per month, on average, 67 units are occupied. We're trying to find a linear equation for the number of units occupied in terms of how much the rent is. So we know that basically increasing the rent by $42 decreases the number of units by three. Well, 42 is divisible by three. So really what I'm thinking is if we decrease, sorry, increase, if we increase rent by $14, right, 42 divided by three is $14 then we will decrease the number of units occupied, which is X by one. So for each $14, we increase the rent by the number of units occupied will decrease by one. So it looks like we can say that X, the number of units occupied, starts off at 70. And then we're going to subtract one, and here's kind of the hard part, one for every $14 we decrease the rent by. So we know that we are starting with a rent of 470, uh, sorry, $434. So we need something over here that's going to essentially start at zero, rent is 434, and then get bigger as the rent goes down. Sorry, as the rent goes up. So I'm not exactly sure how to get this, right? I haven't thought about it ahead of time, but here's what I'm thinking. It's gonna be something like, well, I'm gonna need a 434 minus P? That might be right. I don't, I'm just kind of guessing because I'm just gonna play around with it. So let's see. If the rent was $434, this would be zero. And 70 minus zero would be 70. So that works. When the rent's 434, I get 70 units for X. So let's see, if I increase, so I think I might need to make this a plus sign here to make this work out right. That's all right. Um, right if the rent goes up by $14, so if this were to be, you know, 448, then this would be, mm, I think I need to divide by 14 somehow. Yeah. Okay, that's all right. I can divide by 14. So this is increases by $14. The rent increases by $14. This is gonna be negative 14, but then a negative negative is gonna be positive 14 over 14 is gonna be one, is gonna be a positive one. So this is saying if I increase the rent by $14, I'm going to increase the number of units occupied by one, but I want it to decrease. So I actually need a plus sign here. So let's double, double check just to be sure. So let's see what we get with this equation. So I will say, usually when I have this kind of problem, this is my thought process. I just kind of start off with, well, what do I need to have at the beginning? And what do I need to do when I get to the next spot? So I can see here that if the rent, so if P is equal to 434, the rent's 434, I'm definitely going to get X equal to 70 plus zero, so 70. And then if the rent goes up by $14, right? We determined that if the rent goes up by $14, the number of units goes down by one. So if the rent is now $448, then we should get, let's double check. So 434 minus 448 is negative one divided by four, sorry. 434 divided by four minus 448 is negative 14 divided by 14 is negative one and 70 plus negative one is 69. We probably don't need this one here. So that looks right, finally. Took a minute. So that's the first part. And there's probably a couple different ways you could write this, but this seems not too terrible. So let's look at the second part of the question. Predict the number of occupied units when the rent is set at $546. So that's just asking us to set P equal to 546 and solve for X. Um, I would love to still use the same side of the board. So I think I will just write it up here. So if P is equal to $546, 
then we're going to get x equal to, we're just going to throw in the 546. 70 plus, I'm going to rewrite this as 1 14th times 434 minus 546. And then we're going to calculate that. I think I can erase this part of the information now. So let's see, we're going to get uh, 70 plus 1 14th of 434 minus 546 is going to be, let's see, 112, I believe. Negative 112, sorry. And 112 divided by 14 is 8. So that's going to be 70 minus 8, which is going to be 62. So we would expect there to be 62 units occupied if the rent was $546 a month. And then I don't think we need to do the last question, which is the same sort of thing, predicting um, how much rent is, or how much, uh, how many units are going to be occupied when the rent is $602. It's the same kind of idea, right? We set P equals 602, the rent's going to be um, whatever you get when you plug that in. What I do want to say, which this problem doesn't ask, which I think is definitely where we're going to be going eventually, is the question that this is kind of setting you up for later is what should we set the rent to be so that we maximize the amount of income? So the income or revenue in this case would be the product of these two things. It would be the rent times the number of units occupied. So that would be number of units occupied, uh, which would be 70 plus 114th times 434 minus X times the number of units occupied, which is X. So this equation would tell you how much revenue you would make each month. And then we would maximize this or we figure out how to maximize. Now this one we could actually do because the equation of this is just quadratic and we know how to find the maximum value of a quadratic by finding the vertex of its opening downwards. But in general, we'll talk later on about how to actually optimize things. I don't think we need to do that right now, but I just want to kind of let you know this is what they're setting you up for. They're setting you up to think about, oh, we're trying to maximize or minimize a quantity based on this kind of idea. Let's look at the other question that someone asked me about. And I should move it over to the other side of my screen so I can see it better. Hopefully the picture quality is mm, at least not bad. Are you guys gonna read things? Um, so let's look at the next one. Find equation of the lines that pass through the given point and are parallel to the given line and, per and perpendicular to the given line. So here's the point we're given. And you can pick any point really. So here's the point that happens to be on this problem. Um, negative three fifths, comma, 11 twelfths. And the line is five X plus six Y equals eight. Okay. And then you know, those numbers are in red. So I'm sure they're different for everyone when they do these uh, web assign problems, I think. So I want to find the equation that goes to this point that's parallel and then also perpendicular to this line. So for any kind of equation of a line, you need two things. You need a point, great, we've got the point, and we need a slope. And we don't have the slope yet, but we can certainly find it. So how do we find the slope? Well, here's what I want to make sure everybody knows. The slope is not six. I mean, sorry, the slope is not five or negative five. We have to solve for y completely to find, be able to find the slope of the line. So I'm going to solve for y. I'm getting 6y equals negative 5x plus 8. And then this divide both sides by 6. So that y equals negative 5, 6x plus 8, 6. This part here is not really important at all, but it's still good to be correct. So the slope of this line is negative 5, 6. So if I'm trying to find the equation of the line that is parallel to this line, and goes to this point, it has to have a slope of negative five, six. So here's one way to find the equation of a line. You can say, well, I know that y equals the slope times x plus b, and then you can plug in your point. So my point is y, sorry, x is this, y is that. So 11 twelfths equals negative five, six times negative three fifths 
plus b. And then we're gonna solve for b. So let's see, the fives cancel, that's nice. So this negative one six times negative three over one, this ends up being 11 twelfths equals positive three six, which is one half plus b. Subtract the one half, so 11 twelfths minus one half, but I'm gonna write as six twelfths so I can actually do the subtraction more easily, is equal to b. And then finally, b is equal to five twelfths. So here I end up with the fine. So the thing about doing it this way is then you have to go back and write the final equation. So that the equation of the parallel line is y equal to negative five, six x plus five twelfths. So that's how you can find the equation of the parallel line. But the perpendicular line, the process, well, I'm actually gonna use a different process to show you the other way of doing it, but the process is essentially the same. You're gonna find, you're gonna use the slope and you're gonna find it, you're gonna use it to find the, um, the point. So we know the slope of a perpendicular line is the opposite reciprocal. So we're looking for a per perpendicular. The slope is now going to be, instead of negative five, six, it's going to be positive six, six. You could do the same thing. You could write y equals six fifths times x plus b and then solve for b. But I want to show you the other way of doing this just because I like to do it the other way. So the other way is to use the point slope form and say that you're going to have y minus the y coordinate equal to the slope times x minus the x coordinate. Some people are totally cool with you leaving it like this, um, but often they want you to solve for y. So we're going to distribute the 6 fifths. So y minus 11 twelfths equals 6 fifths times x. And then 6 those are, I always, I'm not great at saying six fifths. Six fifths times positive three fifths is going to be 18 20 fifths. Yeah, sure. And then if I'm solving for y, I'm going to get y equal to six fifths x plus 18 20 fifths plus 11 twelfths which is not super fun to have to add together, but we can. Um, oh, it's kind of gross though, I'm not gonna lie. So I would multiply this by, ugh, I guess 12 over 12. So, yeah. All right, so 25 times 12 is 300. And 18 times 12 is, good question, 18 times 12. Uh, nine times 12 is 108, so 18 times 12 is 216. That sounds right. Yeah. And then 12 times 25 is 300 and 11 times 25 is 275. Wow. That's a gross number. So we end up getting six fifths X plus 216 plus 275 is 491 over 300, which just feels kind of silly. I feel like whoever wrote this, I mean, I guess a computer wrote this problem really. Um, so who wrote this problem? Could have picked slightly nicer numbers. Um, no, Marshall, it does not matter which one you choose is x1, y1, and which one you choose is x2, y2. You just have to be, you have to be consistent. Um, so in fact, actually, someone else just asked a question about how to find the slope passing through two points. So let's go ahead and do that, and then we can kind of look at your question as well. Um, the, I will say for this homework question that was asked about, um, the last part is to, this is use a graphing utility to graph all three equations and then pick the right one. Um, so just to show you guys, because right, I, I imagine most of you are familiar with Desmos, but just in case you're not, you should be familiar with Desmos. So let me show you the Desmos. Why is my computer making funny noises sometimes? I don't know. So let me grab a seat for a sec. So just to make sure everyone knows how to do this, it's pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, graphing calculator. So I'm just going to graph these lines. So I'm going to have the original line, which I know I erased, but let's graph it anyways. It's uh, 5x plus 6y equals 8. Great. And then I'm going to have my two lines here. So one of them is this one, y equals negative 5 divided by 6. Now, if I write x right now, it'll end up in the denominator, so I need to go arrow over and then type x. 
and then plus five twelfths. Okay, and then I also need the perpendicular one, which is this disgusting thing, y equal to six fifths over x, and then I've got plus 491 over, that still seems, I feel like, I feel like I could have made an error just because the number seems kind of gross, but we can look at this and compare it to the answers. Assuming we did our equations correctly, let me move it out of the way here, um, it looks like it's probably this first one. That's the one I would guess it was if it had to be, yeah, that one looks about right. So yeah, it's probably that first one. But that's how you can use Desmos as you were instructed to in this problem to kind of help you figure things out. I would generally encourage you to, if you're trying to see what a function looks like, you're certainly, it's good to be able to graph things by hand on your own, but it's also good to use the tools you have at your disposal. So I would really encourage everyone to get comfortable using Desmos. I wouldn't say you should rely on it, especially if you're having to take exams without any outside materials, which I imagine is probably the case for most people. But um, definitely familiarize yourself with it. It's, it's a fun, useful tool. You can kind of just neat stuff with it. All right. So um, somebody asked how to find the slope between these two lovely looking fractional points. So let's look at these. Um, I still haven't heard back from Professor Wynn, unfortunately, so I don't have access to her canvas yet. Um, so yeah, hopefully I will. But if you have questions from her class, I'm certainly happy to address them as well. I just don't know what they are specifically. So we're looking at the slope passing through the following points. So the points are not nice. They are five, six, column two thirds. And what else have we got here? Uh, five thirds, column negative one third. Okay, and to address Marshall's question, if we're giving two points and we wanna find the slope, doesn't matter which one's which. We well, actually didn't say we wanna find the slope, but it, but generally, yeah, it doesn't matter which one you say is x1, x, x1, y1, which one's x2, y2. So I'm trying to find the slope, which is the difference in the y's over the difference in the x's. You can think of this one as x1, y1, and this one as x2, y2, or the other way around. I usually just kind of pick one. I usually, what I usually actually do is I try to pick the ones that go first to be positive if there's a choice between positive and negative and the ones that go second to be negative if, I, if there's a choice between positive and negative. So I like, I would probably do this as two thirds minus negative one third over. So then once you've selected this one minus this one, the X's subtraction has to be in the same order, meaning it has to be this one minus this one. The top is pretty easy. Two thirds plus one third is three thirds, which just turns out to be one. The denominator, we have to get a common denominator for our fractions. This is gonna be five, six minus five thirds, you multiply by two over two to get 10 cents. So five, six minus 10, six is negative five, six. So I end up with one divided by negative five, six, which is equal to one times negative six fifths, which is just negative six fifths. So that would be the slope between these two points. And if we did it the other way, right? If we subtracted instead, if we did negative one third minus two thirds, right? This one minus this one over five thirds minus five six. We still get the same answer. So we get negative one on top, right? Negative one third minus two thirds is negative three thirds, which is negative one. And the bottom, we have 10 six minus five six, which is negative one over five six, which is negative one times six fifths, which is negative six fifths. Same either way. Just make sure you're consistent about the order you're subtracting things, right? The only time, well, there's kind of two ways I see people usually mess up calculating the slope. First thing, they accidentally do like 
this y minus this y and then this x minus this x, that would get you the wrong sign. The other mistake I often see is people accidentally put the x's on top because they're like, oh, the first thing goes on top. No, the second thing goes on top and the first thing is the one on the bottom. So just be careful and it should be okay. Oh, yeah. A little thirsty there. Um, not in the not in the way that people say it nowadays. Just actually, I need a drink of water and not thirsty. Yeah, I know. It's all fun and games until your teacher says he's thirsty and then it's everything's out the window. All right, so let's take a look at a couple more. Um, yeah, we talked a lot about domain last time. Let's look at, yeah, let's look at some composition stuff and some other stuff. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm really, sorry, I'm just still like, I'm perplexed as to why the video quality was or still is not good. Can we do a few more range problems? Sure. So let me ask, um, as far as range, do you mean, do you want to, are we talking about doing range graphically or are we talking about doing range by finding the domain of the inverse? So I'm happy to do either one, but they're definitely kind of different. Let's look at, both work, okay, sure. So let's, let's actually look at this function. Um, Let's look at f of x equal to x squared plus 3x plus 6. And g of x is going to be the square root of x plus 1. We'll do a few things with these functions. And first, actually, let's, let's find the domain and range of both of them, because we can do both graphically here. So, well, I mean, range, I should say graphically. Domain, you never really need to do graphically. You should always be able to look at the function and look for the three domain issues that can pop up. So for this first one, graph of x, the domain, it should be pretty straightforward to see that there are no domain issues. There's no division, there's no square roots or even roots, and there's no logarithms. So here the domain is everything. The range on the other hand is limited. We know that parabolas, okay. Oh yeah, one-to-one -one function as well, sure. So we know that parabolas have a limited range. Um, this one is going to have some lower bound for its range, right? This, we're not gonna get everything from negative infinity to infinity. We're gonna get something as low as whatever the y value of the vertex is, right? Because this parabola looks something like this. So the range here is going to be whatever the, if I call the coordinates of the vertex of vx and vy, the range is going to be everything from vy inclusive to infinity. If it was a downward opening parabola, it would be the other way around. It'd be everything from minus infinity up to the y value of the vertex. So let's find the y value of the vertex. Um, let's see, this is gonna be a little bit of work. So the x coordinate of the vertex is negative v over 2a, which is negative 3 over 2. And then to find the y value of the vertex, we're gonna plug that in. So the y coordinate is f of negative three halves, which is gonna be negative three halves quantity squared plus three times negative three halves plus six. Negative three halves squared is nine fourths. Three times negative three halves is minus nine halves plus six. Getting a common denominator, this is nine fourths. Multiply this by two over two to get minus 18 fourths. And multiply this by four over four to get 24 fourths. So nine minus 18 is negative nine, plus 24 is 15. So I get 15 fourths, which you could leave as a fraction or you could write as a decimal 3.75. So my range here is, 15 fourths to infinity. Now I didn't actually draw the graph, or I mean, I kind of drew the graph and said, well, I know the lowest value of the range is just the y-coordinate of the uh, vertex, 
but we can actually draw the graph more precisely if we wanted to. For g of x, the domain, we, so we do have a domain issue, right? We have to set the insides of the square root to be non-negative, greater than or equal to zero. And then solving for x is really straightforward here. We just subtract one from both sides. So x is greater than or equal to negative one, which gives us a range of, sorry, a domain of negative one to infinity. And then for the range of this one, we can graph it, right? You're just taking the usual square root function and shifting it one to the which way. Are we shifting it one up, down, left, or right? Hmm, good question. My volume is on, okay. Anybody, you can type in the chat. Are we going left, right, up, or down? Hmm. Hmm. No afraid. No afraid. Okay, so we're going one to the left. And the way we know that is, well, there's, there's a couple ways to know it. I'm seeing, well, first of all, usually the square root function. Um, so uh, that is true, Marshall, that negative six over two eight is negative three. But remember, that's a, so that's not a six, I, uh, that's a B. So it's negative B over two A. And the B value is the coefficient of X, right? Because we're thinking of that quadratic as AX squared plus BX plus C. So in this case, A is one, B is three, and C is six. But I can definitely see how my B looked like a six there. So I understand why you might be thinking that. No, no, no problem at all. I definitely, my writing is not always excellent as I'm sure you're all aware already. So if, you, if you're confused by something I've written on the board, please let me know, I'm happy to clarify. Um, so for this one, for g of x equal to the square root of x plus one, usually the square root function starts off at the origin and just goes up and to the right. Our domain has gone one to the left. So we can just see from the domain that we're starting at negative one. You can also know that when you add something inside the function, right before we take the square root, we added one, everything shifts to the left. I kind of like to think about it as x has to be one less than it would have been if without the plus one to get the same y values as. So if it was just the square root of x, right? If x was four, you get a y value of two. Here, x has to be one less, right? X has to be three to get two out. So that's kind of how I think about it. Um, either way, we can see that the range, the lowest value is clearly zero. And it just goes up and up and up and up and up and up and up. The range is zero to infinity. So that's how we can find the domain and range of these particular functions. Um, I will do one with an inverse function because I think that's worthwhile. But before I do that, I want to look at a couple of things with composition for these two. So where did that? Yeah. I wish my screen had like, I don't know what I wish exactly. I wish, I wish it was bigger, I guess. I mean, it's pretty big, but it could be bigger. Uh, yeah. Feels like there's a joke to be made there that I will abstain from. Of the awkward variety. Okay, so. Let's see. So I do want to talk about composition stuff just for a second. So I still have these two same functions, f of x equal to x squared plus three x plus six, and g of x still equal to the square root of x plus one. Um, I want to find a couple things. Like I want to find f of g of three. So here's what I would usually recommend if I'm trying to find a composition of a function evaluated at a particular point. I don't need to find f of g of x as a function. I could, right? In fact, I will just to kind of show you guys. f of g of x would be f of the square root of x plus one, which would be, so I'm taking this and substituting it in for each instance of x. So I'm going to get the square root of x plus one squared plus three times the square root of x plus one plus six. And we could simplify this, right? If you square this, you get x plus one plus three times the square root of x plus one 
plus six. I guess we can simplify that even further and write it as x plus seven plus three times the square root of x plus one. And then you can plug in three for x and figure out whatever that is. But it's really actually easier usually to just say, well, first, what's g of three? Well, g of three is the square root of three plus one, which is the square root of four, which is two. And then f of g of three is equal to f of two. And f of two is gonna be two squared plus three times two plus six, which is four plus 12, six plus six, which is 16. Right, to me that's easier than doing all this and then plugging in three here and getting three plus seven plus three times the square root of four. You get the same answer, but this is less work in my opinion. Um, on the other hand, what is g of f of three? Well, same idea. I can find f of three first. So f of three is three squared plus three times three plus six, which is nine plus nine plus six, which is 24. And then g of f of three is g of 24. And then I'm gonna plug it into the g function and get the square root of 24 plus one, which is the square root of 25, which is five. Something important to note here, and this is generally true, is that f of g of three does not equal g of f of three. Or more generally, when you compose functions in the opposite order, they are usually not equal to each other. There are some special exceptions to this. Notably, inverse functions are always an exception. But it is generally true that f of g of x does not equal g of f of x. Um, all right, one sec here. Okay, cool. So the other thing I want to do is to calculate some difference quotients with these. And then we'll do another, we'll do a, another range question, but with the other kind of way. So, oops, I, so I want to find, and I think at least Dr. Thompson, Abby, does use delta x. So I want to find and simplify f of x plus delta x minus f of x all over delta x. You will often see people use an h instead of a delta x, but she's using a delta x, that's fine. I like h because it's less work to write an h than a delta x, but delta x is also fine. So when you see something like this, whether it's delta x or h, you should immediately think, okay, the goal here, if I'm evaluating and simplifying as much as possible, the goal is always to make this denominator cancel out. Meaning the h or the delta x that's originally in the denominator, that thing should for sure cancel. Nothing else has to cancel, right? Then we might get other stuff in the denominator eventually, but for sure we want that to cancel. That is our ultimate goal. That said, our intermediate goal that's gonna happen before we can make that happen is everything that doesn't have a delta x in it in the numerator, we wanna make cancel out. So let's figure out what we've got here. So f of x plus delta x is just this function. In fact, it might even be worth writing out over here. So sometimes people like to write this ahead of time. So f of x plus delta x is just the same thing, except instead of x squared, I'm gonna have x plus delta x squared. Instead of 3x, I'm going to have 3 times x plus delta x plus 6. Well, I also wanted to mention, I did post the solutions to the quiz. So if you want to take a look at those, feel free. I also graded the quizzes for those of you that took it. It wasn't required, but some of you did take it. Um, so if you want to see the comments I made on grade scope, you can certainly go look at that as well. So let's see, f of x plus delta x is this. When we I'm going to multiply this out a little bit too. So x plus delta x quantity squared. If we FOIL that out, we get x squared plus 2x times delta x plus delta x quantity squared. So one of the reasons I don't love a delta x is because you usually have to write it as delta x quantity squared. It's fine though. 
So that's what that is. I think I'm gonna run out of room here. You can write it down here. I thought I could make it fit, but you know what? It's not a lot of room. So I've got x squared plus 2x delta x plus delta x squared. That's this part here. And then I've got 3 times x plus delta x, which I'm going to distribute. So 3x plus 3 delta x, and then plus 6. And all of that, that's my f of x plus delta x. Simplify it a little bit minus f of x, so x squared plus 3x plus 6, divided by delta x. It is super important that we have the minus all of this. If it was just, if we forgot the parentheses here, things that we need to cancel wouldn't cancel. So let's rewrite this as x squared plus 2x delta x plus delta x squared plus 3x plus 3 delta x plus 6 minus x squared minus 3x minus 6 all divided by delta x. And now check it out. Some things are going to cancel. Like x squared and negative x squared, like 3x and negative 3x, like 6 and negative 6. So that's why it was really important that the negative is distributed so that the things that are supposed to cancel actually cancel. And now look, every term remaining, the 2x delta x, the delta x squared, and the 3 delta x all have a delta x, which is what we wanted. So what we're going to do is we're going to factor out a delta x from the remaining terms. So on top, we're going to have, if I factor out a delta x, here I'm left with a 2x, here I'm left with just a delta x, and here I'm left with just a 3. Having factored this delta x out, we can now cancel it with the delta x in the denominator, and we're left with a final answer of 2x plus delta x plus 3. Or if you're doing this with h's, your final answer would be 2x plus h plus 3. Um, so that's how we would do something like this. And again, our goal, which we accomplished, is to make that denominator delta x cancel out. Are there questions about this before we do the same thing for g of x? I'm going to take a moment and Wow, there's a lot of you. I mean, it's good. I'm glad there's a lot of you. I'm gonna take a screenshot of all the participants' names so I can take the attendance later. Why, computer, do you want to make dumb noises? Really? Okay, great. Now I can take the attendance later and it won't be so challenging. Awesome. Okay, um, let's see. What else do we get here? So yeah, so let's look at the other one, f of x equal to the square root of x minus plus one, sorry. I'm sorry, g of x equal to the square root of x plus one. I'm gonna do this one with h's, just because it's easier to write h's. If you're using delta x, just pretend like the h is a delta x. So this one does require a little bit more work. So if I wanna find g of x plus h minus g of x, all over h, right? I'm using h's instead of delta x's. That's going to be the square root of, so g of x is the square root of x plus one, g of x plus h is going to be, instead of the square root of x plus one, it's the square root of x plus h plus one, minus g of x, which is the square root of x plus one, all over h. Now, the problem with this is we can't subtract square roots from each other in a meaningful way. Right? This doesn't simplify without some extra work. So the extra work we have to do, and this is typically true when you have a square root plus or minus another square root, is exactly what someone just messaged me directly, which is using the conjugate. So we're going to take this expression, square root of x plus h plus 1 minus the square root of x plus 1 over h, and we're going to multiply by 1. 
But in this case, the one that we're going to multiply by is the conjugate of this expression divided by itself. So when someone says the conjugate of a thing, they mean the same thing, except if it's subtraction here, it's addition in the other one. And if it's addition here, it's subtraction. So conjugates, a typical pair of conjugate pairs that you might recognize are A minus B and A plus B. Those are conjugates. And the great thing about conjugates is that when you multiply them together, what do you get when you multiply A minus B times A plus B? You get A squared and the middle terms cancel. That's the whole reason we multiply by conjugates. Minus B squared. It's great. So yeah, difference of squares always factors as conjugate pairs. And conjugate pairs always multiply together to get a difference of squares. Super useful. So we're going to multiply this by the square root of x plus h plus 1 plus the square root of x plus 1 divided by the same thing. Here's a good rule of thumb for conjugates. When you're multiplying a fraction by the conjugate of one part over the same thing, you always actually want to multiply out the things that are conjugate pairs. So we want to multiply out the top. We want to see what this times this actually is. It's going to be the first thing squared times the second thing squared. So the top is going to end up being the square root of x plus h plus 1 squared minus the square root of x plus 1 squared. The denominator is going to be, so here's the thing. You want to multiply out the conjugates. You don't want to multiply out the things that are not conjugates. Why? Well, we know we want this H to cancel. We don't want to distribute it through to get the other stuff. So here's what happens. This becomes X plus H plus one minus this becomes x plus one. Now be careful here. If I write that, the ones won't cancel and they should cancel. Because again, all the things that don't have an h or a delta x should cancel in the numerator. So the thing is, it should be minus all of this like that, all over the denominator, which is just the same. I'm not going to multiply it out. It's going to be h times the square root of x plus h plus 1 plus the square root of x plus 1. And then on top, I can see that x minus x cancels out and 1 minus 1 cancels out. So I'm going to put h over h times all this stuff. And then the h's cancel. So I end up with, after I cancel the h's, so this h and this h can now cancel, I get 1 over the square root of x plus h plus 1 plus the square root of x plus 1. It's OK to have other h's or delta x's left in the denominator. We just want that original h that was in the denominator to cancel out. Questions about this? OK. It's so satisfying. Yeah, it is. It is. I agree. It is very satisfying how the things cancel. Um, yeah. And we definitely need them to cancel because eventually what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking the limit as h approaches zero. And if h is approaching zero, dividing by zero is a real problem, which is why we need this to cancel out. So then when h approaches zero over here, it's no longer an issue. Let's see, I had a couple more things to do with these functions before we just like go. Um, let me ask you guys. So still the same functions. I know they're not super exciting, but I want to say one more thing. So is f of x equal to x squared plus 3x plus 6? Is f of x 1 to 1? Well, no, it's not. And there's like a million ways you can see it. But one of the ways you can see it is by looking at the graph. I'm not going to really graph it very um, 
very accurately, but I know the graph looks something like this. It may or may not have X and SFs, I don't really care. Um, I don't think it does. But I can see that this graph fails the horizontal line test. Right, there is definitely a horizontal line I can draw that passes through more than one point on the graph. So that means it is not one-to-one, -one, which also means it's not invertible. We can't find an inverse for this function without doing some extra work that I don't think we really wanna do. So this also means it's not invertible. What about this one? Is g of x equal to the square root of x plus one, one to one? Well, does the graph pass the horizontal line test? Looks like it. Right. Any horizontal line I draw will only pass through one or no points on the graph. So this definitely is one to one. Another way you could show it's one to one. So sometimes people get kind of really kind of hung up on showing something's one to one. Typically, the way you show a thing is one to one is you assume the two different y values are the same, and then you show that the x values actually have to be the same. So we could say. If we really want to show it, and I don't know how necessary this really is, but we can say assume g of a is equal to g of b. So we're saying these two y values are the same. Well, if two y values are the same and they have different x values, then it's not one to one, right? That's what's happening here. These two y values are the same, right? Here's a comma f of a. Here's b comma f of b. The two y values are the same, but the x values are definitely different. That means it's not one to one. Different x values gave us the same y value. Here, it is one to one. So if we had different y values, we're actually going to find that the x values had the, or sorry, not different. If you have the same y values, sorry, but the same y value coming from different x values, we're actually gonna see that these x values had to be the same. And here we do, we just plug that into the function. So we're gonna really saying the square root of a plus one equals the square root of b plus one. But the only way that these can be the same is if a is equal to b. Right? There's no way the square root of a thing is equal to the square root of another thing unless the insides are the same. So if these are equal, then a plus one has to equal b plus one. And if those are equal, then A has to equal B. And that shows that they're one-to-one. -one. So you can't, it's not always easy to graph a thing and show it's one-to-one. -one. Um, this one, it is easy to graph it, but it is often not too terrible to say, oh, well, if the Y's are the same, it turns out that the X's actually have to be the same. That means it's one-to-one. -one. Which means this function's invertible. So we should be able to find the inverse. Now, this is where things get kind of bizarre. We'll just talk, we'll do this one very briefly and then we'll talk about the different inverse function. And then I think, oh, let's see. Yeah, and then we'll start talking about limits for like the last 10 minutes. So, what's the inverse of g of x? Now, when you talk about the inverse of a function, it is often important to consider the domain range of that function. So I'm going to remind everybody that the domain of g of x we found, it was negative one to infinity. And the range of g of x we found, and it was everything from zero to infinity. The reason this is important is because when you find an inverse function, well, how do we find, what's the kind of most important step when you're finding an inverse function. So, right, we write y equal to the square root of x plus one. And then what do we do next? We switch x and y. Switching x and y has the effect of interchanging the domain and the range. 
So now when I've switched x and y, it's important to note that for this expression, that we're going to solve for y, but it's really, really important to note that at this point, we now have to say that the domain and the range have switched. So that the domain is now everything from zero to infinity, and the range is now everything from negative one to infinity. This probably isn't going to be a huge deal in your class, but some people make more of it than others. So I wanted to, I didn't want to like not address it. Um, sorry, my... So now if I solve for y, I'm going to square both sides. So x squared equals y plus one. I'm going to throw this pen in the pile of pens that we didn't do. Thing. And then if I solve for y, I get y equal to, oh, this one is y. I knew there was a reason I wasn't doing these pens y equal to x squared minus one. Okay, here's what I want to point out about this. Write this again. So my inverse function, g inverse of x, is equal to x squared minus one. Now, this is the inverse of this, provided that we obey the domain and the range, specifically the domain. If you just looked at this function on its own without having seen where it came from, you would not incorrectly think the domain, right? Here it doesn't look like there's any domain restrictions. And that's true. The problem is that if we're imagining it as the inverse of g of x equal to the square root of x plus one, then it is vital that we have this domain and range restriction. Let me show you graphically what I'm meaning here. You might not be cool this today. We'll start with coffee lessons. So here is my original function. G of x equal to the square root of x plus one. I'm gonna try and draw it relatively nicely. It starts here at negative one. Zero, one, three, two, sure. Well, it's kind of like this. There's my square root of x plus one function. And then, Here's my inverse, g inverse of x, which we just said was x squared minus one. But specifically, it has a domain that's the same as the range of this. So the domain has to be everything from zero to infinity, meaning we don't get anything to the left over here. We get everything, so starting at zero for x, I get zero, negative one, and then I get all this. Right? And I don't get any of this other half of the parabola. These functions are inverses. And specifically, this function x squared minus one is invertible if you restrict its domain to make the function one-to-one. -one. So not a huge deal. This does come up again when we talk about inverse trigonometric functions, which I think is in 16b. Um, but I just wanted to make you guys aware of that, that you can find in, lots of functions can be made to be invertible if you cut them down to just where they happen to be one-to-one. -one. All right, um, sure. Still talking about range. Yeah. I will also point out, because this is something that's always true, is that inverse functions are reflections of each other across the line y equals x. So if I were to draw the line y equals x, these are flips of each other in that line. And it makes sense, right? If you're if you're interchanging x and y, then you should flip across the line where y is equal to x. Right here, I've got the point. Zero, negative one. Here I've got the point one zero. Here I've got the point. I um, actually don't know what point that is. That's okay. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Um, over here I've got the point. You know, two comma two comma three. And then the other graph I have the flips. Right, I have negative one zero. I have zero one. I have three comma two all the points where the x and y coordinates are interchanged of the other one. 
So that's something worth knowing. So is the video quality better now? Like, can you guys see things all right? Or is it still a little blurry? I'm just curious because I have another class later today. I'm wondering how it's going to be for them. You can, you can write in the chat. You can either say it's okay or it's blurry. It's a little blurry. Okay. I'll take it. I mean, what else can I do, right? Um, so yeah, so how do we find the range of something like, I don't know, f of x equal to, sure, 3x plus 7 over 2x minus 4. So this one, we could probably graph it and see what the range is, or at least it's not the range. But typically, once functions get somewhat complicated, it is usually easier to find the domain of the inverse, right? Because again, if you're trying to find the range of a function, well, when you switch x and y, you're switching the domain of the range. So we can do we can instead find the domain of the inverse, and that will be the same as the range of the function. So the range of f of x, the range of f is equal to the domain of f inverse, assuming that the function is invertible, which this one is. So to find the inverse, we do the usual things. I like to write it as y equal to 3x plus 7 over 2x minus 4. All right, it's just easier to work with y. We interchange all the x's and y's. So every y, which should only be 1, becomes x. And all the x's, which there can be multiples of, become y. So you get x equal to 3 y equals 7 over and y minus 4. And now we're going to solve for y. I'm going to multiply both sides by this denominator. So I'm going to have 2y minus 4 times x equal to 3y plus 7. We're going to distribute the x. So I'm going to get 2xy minus 4x equal to 3y plus 7. We're going to solve for y, so we're going to have to group all the y's on one side. So we're going to bring the y's to the left. So 2xy minus 3y equal to 4x plus 7. Factor out a y. So you get y times 2x minus 3 equal to 4x plus 7. And finally, divide by this. So y equals 4x plus 7 over 2x minus 3. And that is our inverse function. And that's the general process for finding the inverse, right? You write your function as y equals whatever, you switch x and y, and then you solve for y. And then we have the added bonus of, well, what's the domain of this? Well, what's not the domain really? What is x not allowed to be? So the domain here of the inverse, we're missing x equal to, now let's see, 2x minus 3 can't equal 0, so x can't equal positive 3 halves. So that's the range of the original. So the range of f of x is, in fact, equal to, I'm going to write it in the interval notation, because that's what we should do is everything except for 3 halves. So negative infinity to 3 halves, parentheses, because they don't want to include it, union 3 halves to infinity. And that is how you find the range. How do they get the 3 halves? Good question. So I looked at this function, and I said, I'm looking at the domain. So I'm trying to find the domain of a function. I'm looking for three possible problems. Is there a square root? No. Is there a logarithm? No. Is there a fraction where I might be dividing by zero? Yes. So I'm going to set the denominator equal to zero and see what that gets me. So if I set 2x minus 3 equal to zero, then I'm going to get 2x equal to positive 3, and then I'm going to get x equal to positive 3 divided by 2. So that's how I'm getting the 3 halves. No problem.
All right, we got five-ish minutes. Let's start talking about the limits. Limits are a big deal. They're kind of the basis for how all of differentiation works. And this class is mostly this quarter about derivatives. Also next quarter. Um, so we really kind of want to make sure we have an understanding of what a limit is. And here's what I would say first and foremost. When you're talking about limits, you're talking about what's happening to a function as x is getting close to a particular value. So if I write this, if I write the limit as x approaches 2 of the function 4x plus 5, what this is really asking, and this is asking a question, or this is saying a thing, saying, what is the function 4x plus 5 getting close to? I could, I suppose I could say what number is 4x plus 5 getting close to as x gets close to the number 2. That's the question that we're asking. So when someone writes the limit as x approaches 2 of 4x plus 5, they're really just saying, I want you to tell me what that function is getting closer and closer and closer to as x is getting closer and closer to 2. With the understanding that we don't actually care what happens at 2. What happens exactly at 2 is not important. In this function, it's going to be kind of fine. So we can look at the graph. With the graph of 4x plus 5, um, this line with a positive slope will look something like this, right? There's no discontinuities. It's perfectly nice and normal. Um, and if I look at the point, here's 2. I know that if I actually plugged in 2 to the function 4x plus 5, I would get 2 times 4, which is 8 plus 5, which is 13. So this point here is the point 2 comma 13. And it is true for this particular function that as the x values get closer and closer to 2, the corresponding y values do get closer and closer to 13. And that's true whether we're approaching 2 from the left side or whether we're approaching 2 from the right side. In either case, as x gets closer and closer to 2, the y values get closer and closer, sorry, the y values get closer and closer to 13. So we would say that the limit as x approaches 2 of 4x plus 5 is not equal to 12, it's equal to 13. Now, what I want to stress here is this doesn't actually mean the function itself is actually ever equal to 13. It is equal to 13 here, but it doesn't mean that's always the case. It just means, and what this really says is that as the function gets close, as the x values get closer to 2, the function values get closer to 13. Do they equal 13 at 2? Maybe. They do here, but they don't have to. Let me show you another example that's similar, but not quite the same. Mm, I can even, I guess, come up with a function where it actually happens to be the same thing, but I don't know. So now I want to say, what's the limit as x approaches 2 of, sure, why not, x squared minus 15x plus 26. That's not going to come out to be what I want it to be. Why not try to be so fancy? I don't know. Let's not be so fancy. Let's be super not fancy. x squared minus 5x plus 6 over x minus 2. Now, what I want to point out here is that this function does not exist at 2. If you plugged in 2, right, if we call this g of x, I want to make it extremely clear that g of 2 is equal to, well, let's see, I plug in 2 on top, I get 4 minus 10 plus 6, which is 0. I plug in 2 on the bottom, I get 2 minus 2, which is also 0. And 0 over 0 is very much undefined. 0 divided by 0 does not equal 1. 0 divided by 0 does not equal 10. 0 goes into 0 how many times? 
It could be anything. Literally, actually, that is the right answer. Zero divided by zero could be anything. This is what's called an indeterminate form. Meaning when you have some, when you have an expression that has this form, the limit of it can actually end up being any possible value. Anything from negative infinity to positive infinity or anywhere in between. But now here's what I want to show you. This function, I'm sorry, I got, I got one minute. Okay, x or minus sine of x plus six over x minus two. We can factor the top. We factor this x minus three times x minus two over x minus two. The x minus two is cancel. And this is function is equal to x minus three with the knowledge that x is not allowed to equal two. Because if you plugged in two, you would actually get undefined, indeterminate. I'm going to graph this. It's still a line. It's been missing a point. So x minus three has a y-intercept of negative three and x-intercept of positive three. Looks like that, except I'm missing what's happening at two. Now, here's what we know. If I did plug in two, two minus three is equal to negative one. This point would be the point two comma negative one. In fact, we say this graph has a hole at the point two negative one. Now, here's what's kind of great about this. And this is what's really super important to take away. I know we're over time, it's gonna be like one minute. It's really, really important to know that when I say the limit is x approaches two of this, I wanna know what's happening to the function values as x is getting closer and closer to two. But we don't give a damn what's happening at x equal to two. It does not matter at all. So as the x values get closer and closer and closer and closer, but not equal to two, the y values get closer and closer and closer and closer to negative one. And that's true whether we're approaching two from the left or if we're approaching to from the right. The y values on either side are getting closer and closer and closer to negative one. So what we say is that the limit as x approaches two of x squared minus five x plus six over x minus two, the limit is equal to negative one. Now we all know from the graph that this function actually never has a y value that's equal to negative one, right? We're missing that y value, that's okay. The limit doesn't mean that the function ever equals that y value. It just means that the function, as x gets closer to this particular value, the function gets close to this value here. It might not ever actually equal it though. It doesn't in this example. It does in this example. But regardless, it doesn't actually matter, right? Whatever's happening at two or whatever x is approaching is inconsequential as far as the limit's concerned. Limit's concerned with what's happening immediately next to two, but not actually at two. All right, I've talked enough.